live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? Welcome to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on Twitter, on TikTok, and on True Social. You can find Everything on Instagram at Real Scott McKay. The YouTube videos and all sorts of other goodies can be found by searching my name, Scott McKay, S C O T M C K A Y on YouTube. The website is mountaintoppodcast.com. And as always, gentlemen, you can join our thriving Facebook group by searching the Mountaintop Summit on Facebook. Hey, listen. Let's hit the ground running today. We got an excellent show for you. We've never done this particular topic before. And that topic I'm going to call conspiracy against your confidence. We're going to talk about all sorts of ways that we as men sabotage our own confidence in ways that may not even really be apparent to us. So we're going to kind of delve into some blind spots here and talk about some other ideas in ways that I'm sure you haven't ever considered before. My guest is a new friend of mine. I make lots of new friends all the time, don't I? Her name is Dr. Joan Rosenberg, and she's terrific. We were talking briefly before we started recording this episode. She's a professor of graduate psychology at Pepperdine University in California, and she specializes in confidence and resilience and all sorts of human traits related to those particular factors. So without anything further, Dr. Joan, welcome. Thank you so much, Scott. It's actually a real treat to be here. Well, tell me why, because, you know, (laughs) as a psychology professor, you know why I would love to hear how wonderful we are around here. So uh, go for it. Because um, I can tell from our, if you will, our pre-conversation, how engaged you are in material and learning and thinking and just love that. So it's a, it's a treat. Well, you know what? One of the blessings and curses of living my life is I'm probably the most curious person I've ever met, which means I'm very easily distracted by shiny objects, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, either objectively or cognitively. And I think way too much about way too many things, but it also, I think, helps helps make life a lot more enjoyable. The more you get to know people and the world around us, I think the world becomes a better place, certainly a more uh, understandable place and I dare say a less scary place, don't you think? I would agree. And uh, I, I, curiosity is a wonderful way to approach life. So it's uh, it actually fends off against anxiety and other things when you can approach life from a curious stance. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Now, your book is called 90 Seconds to a Life You Love, How to Master Your Difficult Feelings to Cultivate Lasting Confidence, Resilience, and Authenticity. Now, those are three buzzwords there, confidence, resilience, and authenticity. Uh, Any book with that magic trifecta of words in the title has to be, you know, very popular. What intrigues me about that title is that immediate gratification aspect to it. 90 seconds to a life you love. Describe to me how you arrived at those 90 seconds. Well, the first thing for me to tell you is that the 90 seconds is not mine. So it's I want to attribute to the person who first named it. uh, That was Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. And the the reason the the book starts that way, obviously, is is it's up to hook people in in terms of title. But my big question was, what made it so difficult for people to handle unpleasant feelings? Because for me, they contribute to so much in our life when we're able to handle them well or reasonably well. And Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor talked about uh, that when any given feeling kind of fires off or gets triggered in the body, there's a rush of biochemicals that run into our body, they activate bodily sensations, and then they uh, flush out of the, our bloodstream uh, in a roughly an upper limit of 90 seconds, which means that any given feeling or or we can call kind of body sen- body sensation wave lasts roughly an upper limit of 90 seconds. So it's Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor's observation, but for me, I was able to synthesize it in my work to help people understand not only 
uh, kind of the whole experience around unpleasant feelings, but how to be able to manage them more effectively. And when they realize it's only 90 seconds, they go, oh, I can do that. Yeah, you know, that's why I asked you this question, because it's not merely a marketing gimmick. It's not, hey, no. whisper three simple words into this woman's brain and she'll spread her legs for you. <laughs> or, you know, here's how to change your entire life in one minute or less. Uh, you know, like Kenneth Blanchard stuff, you know, from a management right. perspective. Right, management manager, right. Right. It's, uh, it's scientifically based. And the tremendous intrinsic value to any man listening is basically found in the truth that if I just give myself 90 freaking seconds before I knee jerk to something, chances are I'll simmer down. So part of our growth process as men to being better men, to being more mature, more responsible men is instead of just ranting at this guy who just cut us off or getting all defensive with this woman who maybe said she wouldn't go out with me right now. I give myself 90 seconds just to cool off a bit. You know, baseball managers should do this. Uh, <laughs> you know, right. Every, right. every guy in the world would benefit from a blessed freaking 90 seconds of just kind of reflecting on where these emotions are coming from, processing it all and just dealing with it. And so I think that's actually really smart. Um, but what I wanted to do was make sure these guys didn't roll their eyes and consider that another marketing gimmick because it's far from it. And I also think it's quite a wonderful way to kick off this conversation because it's something I think we can all relate to. So here you come along, and the first thing you do is let us know, hey, 90 seconds is all you need, and you can conquer this stuff. And what is it we're conquering? It's our response to these difficult feelings to cultivate lasting confidence, resiliency, and authenticity. And when your publicist sent me you know, a really nice, comprehensive description of your work, Dr. Joan, what jumped off the computer screen at me were these ideas of ending harsh self-criticism and absorbing compliments instead of deflecting them. And we as men are infamous for being our own worst enemy, being our own harshest critics. Nothing's ever good enough for us. Therefore, nothing ever seems to be good enough for anybody else, or at least we're hallucinating that idea. And meanwhile, Anytime someone criticizes us, we get real defensive about that. And the most fascinating part of all, even when people compliment us, we deflect them, right? That's just right. a fascinating set of circumstances. So basically, you know, here we are as men, Dr. Joan, we're harsh on ourselves. And then, you know, we bristle when someone else agrees with us. And then even when someone says, hey, you know, I actually think you're doing a great job. You know, I actually think you're pretty competent. I actually like the work you do. You know, we kind of go into J.K. Simmons mode from Whiplash and imagine that the words good job are the two most dangerous words in the English language. And we go, no, no, I'm going to rebel against you thinking I'm doing a good job. I'm going to rebel against your positive feedback because I don't deserve it and or I don't want to come off as egotistical by agreeing with you. I feel like I have way too much heavy lifting to do. I've got to keep striving for something more. I can't rest on my laurels, et cetera, et cetera. What is, right. what is the psychology of that? You know, the, the, I would bring it down to one word in this case, and, and that has to do with kind of an openness to being vulnerable. And when I think about vulnerability, I think about it as this sense that we could be hurt. Uh, and and, and uh, what I talk about in the book are two different kinds of vulnerability, but in, in this case, it, it, it's kind of vulnerability we choose into. Uh, I, like there's a vulnerability that we don't choose into, I think the, that we all experience, that I call non-conscious vulnerability. It's the notion that we any one of us could be hurt at any time. But there's conscious vulnerability that we choose into. So when we're choosing into a relationship, we're choosing into work, we're choosing into performance or performance sports or anything that puts us out in front of somebody else, then we're vulnerable. We're open to being hurt. And I think that the notion around criticism, whether it's self-criticism, which I consider a distraction from unpleasant feelings, which may require a little bit more explanation, and other feedback, again, I think often gets turned into you're criticizing me. 
And then the compliments, the same thing. I think that, that if you're going to compliment me, then uh, you are seeing me in a particular way. And I, that leaves me feeling vulnerable. So for me, all three of those come down to vulnerability. That last factor, if you're complimenting me, you're putting me in a vulnerable position. How so? It's inviting me to reflect on myself. So here, let me let me go to where I how I see compliments to start with. Um, okay. I, the compliments compliments to me are a reflection of you back to you. So it's like someone holding up a mirror and saying, "This is this is how I see you." It's not coming out of the blue, out of the out of a vacuum. It's you know, it's just not it's not being made up. I'm talking about genuine compliments. And the idea here then is that if I don't take them in, then I'm denying someone else's reality of me. And their observation is coming out of an experience with me or of me. So it's not, it, like I said, it's not coming out of the blue someplace. So I'm not only denying reality of someone else, I'm denying my own reality. So, so for instance, let's say I'm a great singer and, and someone was moved by my singing and they came up to tell me that. And then I play it off and I go, oh, it was nothing. After hours and hours of practicing, years and years of developing my voice, et cetera, et cetera. And I just play it down. For me, that takes away from the experience of, for both people, the one who's giving the compliment and the one who is receiving the compliment. I agree with you. And I've actually heard that sentiment expressed by other experts in the field before. What's wrong with the words, thank you? Uh, you know, thank you. I really appreciate that you liked my work. And I remember when I first heard about the concept you're describing right here, Dr. Joan, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I was suffering from this ailment myself. I had gone my entire childhood and, you know, let's be honest, part of my early adulthood being an extreme people pleaser mm -hmm. and really feeling like I had to seek approval from people. And of course, I figured out, I don't know why I said, of course, it isn't obvious to everybody. It wasn't obvious to me till way too late, in my opinion. But as soon as I stopped trying to get approval from people, people stopped withholding it from me. <laughs> they started <laughs> enjoying me, my work, my presence, my abilities a lot more because I wasn't trying to impose it upon them sure. to make friends or to gain approval. It's rather like a stand-up comedian who needs the audience to laugh with him rather than helping the audience feel better about themselves. I've seen audiences that say open mic nights literally try not to laugh at the comedian on stage because the comedian is just so damn needy. And I think a lot of guys can really relate to this. And it comes back full circle because you were talking about this idea of vulnerability. And you mentioned yourself that you kind of see vulnerability as heading off in two different paths. And you put it in a wonderful way. You've kind of described a path that you're forced into versus one that's kind of self-imposed. And I couldn't help but think of the work of Brene Brown, of course, who has a very, very popular TED Talk. Right. You're a three-time TEDx speaker, by the way, correct? That's correct. Yeah, I see. So uh, your fellow TEDx laureate, as it were, right. Brene right. Brown has one of the most popular TED Talks of all time on this very subject. And, of course, how she describes vulnerability is identifying an area where you could theoretically get hurt. There's some risk involved, but having the courage and facing it anyway. And for men, I think they view the word vulnerability as synonymous with like a possum crossing the I-5 freeway. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. You're just a sitting duck. And that is a kind of an emasculating feeling to most men. The last thing we want to feel is physically powerless. But like you said, when one chooses to put oneself in a vulnerable position, that involves courage, which is indeed very manly. Uh, one example of exactly what you're talking about is when a man sees a woman he wants to meet and ask out on a date, that involves a lot of vulnerability to go risk asking her out and seeing what happens. So this is something I think a lot of guys can relate to. And uh, I'm really glad you brought it up. One of the ideas that you talk about, Dr. Joan, that kind of goes in tandem with what we were just discussing is this idea that confidence and resiliency have everything to do with your ability to know you can handle unpleasant emotions. And one of the central tenets of your book is that 
there are these confidence keys. And it involves distracting or disconnecting from your feelings versus allowing yourself to actually feel into them. And, you know, that would involve, well, vulnerability on our part. You list sadness, shame, helplessness, anger, embarrassment, disappointment, frustration, and here's that word again, vulnerability. Talk to us about how humans in general, but especially men, tend to distract or disconnect from those feelings. In essence, basically denying them, sticking our proverbial head in the sand. When allowing ourselves to feel them would actually increase our confidence and resiliency. Talk as long as you want about that, because that's wonderful. That, well, there's a lot of ideas embedded in that. So the first is to understand that uh, kind of why I chose those eight and then to kind of for me to take it from there. So that uh, what I found is that if someone had a hard time experiencing and expressing, so I'm going to add not only ex the ex experience part, but an expressing part to the whole range of what we felt and especially those eight feelings, then they didn't feel as capable of handling what life threw at them or handling the experience of life. So for me, the, those eight feelings really are kind of the foundation then of someone feeling confident. And, and so the way I define confidence is that it's the deep sense that you can handle the emotional outcome. And in this case, it's the eight feelings you just named. So it's the deep sense you can handle the emotional outcome of whatever you face or whatever you pursue. And, and what I realized is that, is that pretty much everything we do in life, um, if it doesn't turn out the way we want or the way we, we believe it needs to turn out, then it, it tends to come down to one or more of those eight feelings. Now, there's nuances of those eight, but those seem to be a great shorthand. And, and so my effort then is to help people be able to experience and then ultimately express unpleasant feelings along with pleasant ones. And that's how those eight became the foundation of confidence. It's also a foundation of resilience, because if I'm going to bounce back from something, I've got to be able to handle frustration or disappointment or my anger that something's not turning out the way I want or that I got embarrassed about something, but I'm going to persist and persevere anyway. And so that the bounce back quality, one aspect of it is having your ability to experience those eight feelings as the foundation. You know, a popular point of view regarding emotions, either positive or negative, mm -hmm. it really always boils down to two emotions, love or fear. And some people agree with that. Some people don't. As I walk on this earth and live and breathe and have my being, I'm starting to realize that there's something to that, at least in my own estimation. And the eight negative feelings that you mentioned here seem to be, well, <laughs> the hall of shame of fear-based emotions, sadness, shame, helplessness, mm -hmm. anger, embarrassment, disappointment, frustration, mm -hmm. and vulnerability. So you're talking a lot about vulnerability as an expression of courage. So just for the sake of conversation, assuming these would be all fear-based emotions as opposed to love-based emotions, if courage is admitting to the fear and facing it, then courage basically leads to confidence. All of that follows logically in my mind. Am I onto something? Right. No, I would agree with you. But again, here's here's the way I, I think about how you move to, if you will, you move to the courageous part of it. And what I do is see vulnerability as uniquely different than the other seven. And, and what I found is that if I'm feeling vulnerable, then the way I handle my experience of vulnerability is by understanding that I can experience and move through or handle the other seven feelings. Because anytime I put myself in a vulnerable position, or even if I'm in a vulnerable position that I don't want to be in, if I see myself as being able to handle the other seven feelings, then I can tolerate my vulnerability and now I can be courageous. Now I can go ahead and do whatever it is I need to do and take the steps that people would describe as courageous or confident because I know I can handle the undesired emotional outcome of those other seven feelings. Yeah, vulnerability is very pivotal compared to the other seven, isn't it? 
And to, to me, I, I will tell you that that's the if someone gets that single kernel, that that one observation, and you can apply it to every single aspect of your life, asking for help, asking a woman out for a date, you know, asking for directions, um, making a statement about how much you care about somebody, expressing an interest in a raise or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. If you understand that vulnerability, again, is that you're sort of putting yourself in a position where you could get hurt and you have an understanding that that hurt, in quotes, is going to look like one or more of the other seven feelings and you see yourself as being able to handle those other seven feelings, then you can go pursue anything you want at any point. So vulnerability, as we've already talked about, can be positioned as either a good thing or a bad thing. Perhaps not only situationally, but I don't know, as far as our mindset is concerned, too. So if we can take that concept of vulnerability and convert it from something that's universally negative in our minds to something that might quite positively lead to a chance to exercise some courage and do some good in the world and do some good for our self-esteem and our, I don't know, sense of personal power in this world. Sure. And all of a sudden vulnerability takes on a new light and you can handle these other seven emotions much more effectively. But the catch-22, of course, is how am I viewing vulnerability? And if I can view it as something that will increase my power because I get to apply courage, then I can deal with sadness, shame, embarrassment, disappointment, frustration a lot more effectively. Because after all, I can't think of good embarrassment or rock-solid disappointment or healthy frustration. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, if it gets you off a of top dead center and gets you to do something – Great, but I think the courage would always be a lot more effective, right? Uh, sure. Yes. Of course, the courage would be more effective. I don't tend to look at vulnerability negatively at all. In fact, I don't, I don't even call any of those eight feelings negative. I call them unpleasant or uncomfortable, but they, they, those feelings actually exist for protective purposes. That's, that's why they're present in our life. And and so I, I never call them bad or negative. Vulnerability to me, many people will associate with the idea of weakness, but I don't see it as weakness. Um, and when you can choose into being vulnerable, like performing, like going out on stage and singing or, or in, even engaging and asking someone out, right, that, that when you choose into vulnerability, you're actually at your greatest strength. So I only see vulnerability Again, either is a very human experience and not weakness, or that it's something that's tied to our greatest strength. How does optimism versus pessimism play into everything you just mentioned? <laughs> optimism to me is a, an attitude of resilience. And it's also shown from scientific research, tons of research studies on this, that, that when we're optimistic, we actually buoy up our immune system. Um, pessimism and cynicism, I'm going to add one in there, I see as disguised grief. And I think of pessimism and cynicism as preemptive disappointment. Man, that's powerful. Disguised grief, preemptive disappointment. Elaborate. Um, I think of disguised grief as kind of the gap between what we want, what we desire, what we dream of what we might have needed and what we really get or what we really got. Well, it sounds like the human condition. Uh, it is, and all of us have some measure of, I think, disguised grief. But I, part of the way I identify it is to listen to the words that people use. And again, if I go with optimism, somebody, again, is, is going to hold uh, – That's an adi- like I said, that's an attitude of resilience is going to make a difference in somebody staying the course through something and persevering. Um, and pessimism and cynicism to me are, I'm going to hold this attitude that something's going to, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm going to wait for, to get hurt or something like that. So I'm actually in the state of disappointment and preemptively. And why do I do that? Because I don't see myself as being able to handle it in the moment. And so I see it as, and disappointment. There's four of the eight feelings that you've mentioned that I consider as comprising grief. And and I think of grief in general as being comprised of sadness, helplessness, anger, and disappointment. So that whether we experience one of those or all of those collectively, 
um, we're experiencing some measure of grief. Have you ever noticed that the more privileged the culture, the more they complain? <laughs> I, I, I would have to sit back and think about that one. I, I, certainly, I think there's some entitlement that comes into that. And so yeah. they think they have some measure to complain. But I, I, I will have to think about that one. One of the phenomena that you mentioned to me that you'd love to talk about, and of course, I'm happily obliging. I think it's a fascinating potential topic, is this idea of genders, men and women, not being particularly good at getting feedback from each other. Now, of course, since we have an audience full of men here, we're going to focus on men not being able to receive feedback from women very well. Uh, a lot of times we as guys feel attacked or criticized or nagged or that somehow our very manhood is being challenged whenever a woman says, hey, you know what, you might want to fix this or do this a little bit better. Or if a woman comes up and goes, no, Papa, you're not doing this right. You need to back up a trailer by putting your hand at the bottom of the steering wheel and doing it this way instead of weaving around all over the parking lot. Somehow we feel like that would be a direct assault on our manhood. But meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of angry feminists out there who – favor the word mansplaining to describe the arrogance of men, typically, I guess, insulting a woman's intelligence and assuming she's stupid and needs to be taught everything. So the only conclusion I can arrive at personally is that men and women don't like getting feedback from each other, typically. So talk to us a little bit about that whole dynamic in your estimation. Well, one, I think delivery is important. So, <laughs> right. right? <laughs> so. Yeah. At the, at the minimum, delivery is important. And in both cases, my thing is to, to be able to approach something by offering information as opposed to telling. So that, so that what I'm doing is I'm engaging the other person in their own receptiveness to hear what I have to say. So it's like, you know, I've, I've got something to say. Are you open to it? Or, I, you know, I have, I have a different idea. Are you open to it? So that basically there's a little bit – and it again, doesn't have to happen all the time when you're in a, a relationship where that can move easily. You don't, you don't have to keep on asking, but it doesn't always start out that way. So my thing is to, to be soft about it, to offer it in a, in a tentative way that somebody can say, yes, I want to hear it or no, I don't. And, and what I've experienced more often in terms of men's receptiveness to feedback from women – and you already raised it, uh, Scott, is that is that it gets to once it hits the eardrum, it, it moves from information. What's intended is information to criticism. Oh, I've been at this a while. <laughs> I, I, yes, I know. <laughs> so and by this, I mean, not only dating coaching, but being a male human being. Uh, no, I understood that. I yeah. totally understood. <laughs> so, it, but the, it's a real challenge when there's a when there's a genuine interest in offering information uh, because a, a woman might hold a bigger vision for a guy, and she wants that guy to step into it, or she has information she or has a response to something that will, in her estimation, make a relationship better or a connection deeper, then it often, again, the challenge here is that oftentimes it, it, instead of it being heard as just information, it gets translated into criticism. And, and what I've watched, Scott, is a sequence. It goes from in, intended information to once it hits the eardrum, it's criticism. The criticism is a suggestion that I've done bad. I've done bad leads to I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling bad leads to I am bad. And if that sequence persists over time in any given relationship, then it turns into uh, from I am I am bad, it, it becomes I'm shut down. I'm withdrawing from the relationship. I'm in the relationship with one foot out of it, and then I'm gone. So that inspires us to talk again about vulnerability. Right. Because if – someone is making a suggestion and I see it as a personal attack, then frankly, I don't have the courage to face up to this bit of information and let's just throw it on the table. Okay. Regardless sure. of the intent of the person giving me that information, you know, they may think I'm a total bum and be trying to insult me or they may have my best interest at heart. But if I'm a man who's interested in my personal betterment, I would do well to consider that information regardless of the source of it. 
And, you know, what I talk about is looking for patterns. Like if four or five people offer the same suggestion for me to do better, you know, maybe I should listen to them as right. opposed to an isolated personal attack. One of the things that I can't help but think about again is how the more well-adjusted a person is, the less of an approval seeker they are as well. In other words, I feel pretty good about who I am. My identity, my self-esteem are all pretty much rock solid insofar as they can be for a mere mortal human, right? Sure. The easier it becomes for me to hear what other people are suggesting and allow it to be considered as reality. The shining example that comes to mind, and I've talked about this on the show before. Some of these guys are probably sick of hearing it, but I've had the wonderful opportunity to coach Navy SEALs in person, and I find them to be the most coachable people ever. Right. Because they don't need me to be a Navy SEAL. I mean, they got that handled, right? And I'm yep. most certainly not. I wouldn't even want to be. But they came to me for a specific reason, and they are sponges of information relative to what they came to me for. Why? Because it's in their training. Not only are they fierce physical fighting machines, but they're incredibly formidable information gathering engines. It's all about power in a multifaceted, holistic way. So what tends to happen is when we as guys resist any input at all, it kind of has this Dunning-Kruger effect to people in the know of saying, man, what an idiot. This guy's a buffoon. He's cheating himself out of an opportunity to get smarter here. And obviously, when someone is coming from a very arrogant position where they need to teach you how to act from their own personal opinion, that could probably be misplaced also. And I can understand how people would push back against that. But, you know, when we're talking about men who just refuse to accept any input, it really comes down to lack of courage to face into a vulnerable position. Once again, full circle, right? Right. And it, and again, the key here is being able to hear the information without turning it into to a negative self-critique. You've got to stay in an open position and go, all right, I'm being provided information here. I can either make use of it or not, but I don't have to become defensive and I don't have to become angry. I can take it in and, and see if I can make sense of it or ask more questions about it. Dr. Joan, one of the things you talk about is the idea of anxiety and addictions being workarounds, kind of, you know, ways we can hide from expressing our emotions or feeling into our emotions. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, so that, and that takes us back actually to an earlier question you had about uh, distractions as well. I happen to think that um, there are many different, in fact, in the book, I talk about 35 different ways that we move away from our emotional state and doing what I call trying not to know what we know. And I want people to know what they know and to be able to lean into unpleasant feelings and or, again, the whole range of what we, we sense and experience. And the distractions and anxiety to me are kind of roughly the same. Anxiety, I think of as a cover for the eight unpleasant feelings. So that anxiety on its own as a concept is way too vague to me as a psychologist. If I were to ask 10 people what they experience when they experience anxiety, I typically would get eight to 10 different answers. So it's too vague for me to work with. And my experience overall is that it really is a reflection of one or more of the eight unpleasant feelings. So my thing is for people to ditch the word anxiety and instead to see if they can identify it more specifically as one or more of those eight feelings. In the same way, I see distractions as doing the same thing, as moving us away from unpleasant feelings. So the, if we're talking about women, it might be shopping. And for men, it might be sex. It might be porn. It might be substance use, which also is true for women. Um, the like, men can shop too. I don't mean to make it so gender specific. No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> But but I, I mean those are really common ones. Food is a common distractor. Oh, yeah. um, I, but also th again the experience of anxiety to me is or what people would describe as anxiety is a distraction from the eight unpleasant feelings. Um, having feelings about feelings is a way to distract. So if I'm angry that I'm sad, uh, or I'm angry that I'm disappointed, that's a way to distract. Uh, and again, there's a whole host of other ones that are possible. But it, I think of all those distractions as 
actually uh, distractions that keep us away from our more genuine experience and as a result that keeps us away from being living more authentically in the world. And addictions, I would imagine, are best described as ways we numb those feelings we don't want to face. Exactly. Alcohol. Absolutely. Ice cream. Yep. All right. Fantastic. You said there are about 35 different ways you can distract. A few of them came to mind in my notes here before we started talking. Blame, pessimism, uh, this idea of echo chambering, finding people who will help you feel safe in your misery and being a part of something bigger in the most destructive, uh, toxic way imaginable. One of them that also came to mind, I have to credit to my good friend, Dr. Mark Golston, whose work you might be familiar with. Mm -hmm. He calls it fear-based aggression. Because I'm afraid of something, because I don't want to discuss something, because I'm afraid you might hurt me, I lash out at you, perhaps even temporarily at the beginning of a social interaction. An example would be, uh, because I've had a bad experience with women, if a woman comes to me, introduces herself to me, and is even nice to me and shows interest, I don't trust it. And I'm thinking there's some sort of ulterior motive and I tell her to go away and leave me alone, which she flatly wouldn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, women, of course, can present with that kind of response to a man who would talk to them. He didn't do anything wrong, but because right. she's had a negative experience, she projects that onto any guy who would seek right. to talk to her. All of those seem to kind of rhyme with this distraction elements away from feeling into my negative emotions, don't you think? Yes, uh, absolutely. In fact, I, I talk about what I call either transmuting feelings or a default feeling. So rather than allowing myself, for instance, to experience disappointment, if I have that sense, that tinge of it, I immediately go to anger. And the only thing you see for me is anger. So I think that, that oftentimes I'll watch both men and women transmute a feeling so that it starts out as one thing, but the only way it gets expressed to others is in a given, a, a different given form. And that can be healthy or unhealthy, can't Correct. it? Correct. Absolutely. Well, mostly it's unhealthy. From my standpoint, mostly it's unhealthy. I would rather have disappointment be expressed as disappointment than raging anger. Got it. Got it. You know, talking about 90 seconds, I'm saying this halfway tongue in cheek, but you can spend a mere 90 seconds on political Twitter and see everything you've talked about today on parade. Mm, being yep. <laughs> paraded out into the open. Yes. Her name is Dr. Joan Rosenberg. She's a professor of graduate psychology at Pepperdine University in beautiful Malibu, California. And she's the author of 90 Seconds to a Life You Love. How to Master Your Difficult Feelings to Cultivate Lasting Confidence, Resilience, and Authenticity. By now, gentlemen, you know Dr. Joan knows her stuff. She's been at this a while. She's spent a lot of time thinking about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put her book at the top of my Amazon Influencer queue at www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon. And I'm also going to point you to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Joan, J-O-A-N, where you can get a copy of her book on Amazon and perhaps leave her a nice review after you've read it. Once again, that's mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Joan, J-O-A-N. Dr. Joan Rosenberg, great conversation. I know these guys love really intelligent expressions of some ideas and topics that are really meaningful to us. And this is most certainly one. And I uh, appreciate having you on and hope you'll come back someday soon. I'd love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much also. And gentlemen, if you've not been to mountaintoppodcast.com lately, let me tell you what, you can click on the big button near the top of the page and check out the master classes we have going on. Hey, there's a new one every month, and they're built around topics that are of tremendous interest to men everywhere. So far, we've talked about flirting. We've talked about bold confidence that earns respect. The most recent one, as of the release of this podcast, has been on how to make women love you. And we hit the ground running. They're fluff-free, and the guys we're attending are loving every minute of it. Check that out at mountaintoppodcast.com, or you can go directly to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash masterclass. Also, gentlemen, you can click the big red button at the upper right-hand corner of mountaintoppodcast.com. Get on my calendar and talk to me for free about where you are right now, the goals you have with regard to being the best man you can be and getting the right women into your life, and we can perhaps put together a plan of action that will take you from point A to point B. 
I guarantee results for my guys insofar as I will be the last coach you ever need for this area of your life. So get on my calendar at mountaintoppodcast.com. Also want to thank my sponsors, Origin in Maine, Hero Soap, and Keyport USA. Gentlemen, if you are doing business with our sponsors, you are introducing yourself to some of the highest quality items you will ever introduce into your masculine frame of mind. Hero Soap will make you smell good, and it doesn't have any artificial ingredients like phthalates and parabens that would emasculate you in any way, shape, or form. Great stuff. Keyport is the most amazing everyday carry device you can ever custom build for yourself. This is not your grandfather's Swiss army knife. Just wait until you check out mountaintoppodcast.com front slash keyport and see what you can build for yourself. Uh, pretty sharp, cool stuff. And last but not least, if you're not wearing origin in Maine's boots and jeans, you are denying yourself two of life's great joys. My origin jeans and boots are among my favorite items in my wardrobe. I think both of them will outlast me. Okay. Also, wonderful natural supplements to help increase your health as a man. I mean, these are the supplements that fuel Jocko Willink himself, gentlemen. So be sure to check those out at Origin in Maine. You can go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash origin to check them out. And anytime you partake of any of the goods purveyed by any of our three sponsors, you can use the code MOUNTAIN10, the coupon code that is, to get an additional 10% off. It's all there for you and more at mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.